Hit it, Jeff. Woo! <laughs> Hi. Well, that that one's, that one's on your calendar. It's on your calendar too, right? May fourth. Yeah. I don't think so. It. I looked at it, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to make that one. Yeah. But you live in Pennsylvania territory. He can see Pennsylvania from his house, sort of, if we cut down all the trees and burn down all the houses. I can see the planes coming up for a landing building in Pennsylvania. So I think that he, counts. He's, a, he's in Atlanta <laughs> as a fan of Pennsylvania sports teams, therefore you must go to all events in Pennsylvania. Just like I must go to all events in New York, such as this webinar! Yay! Yay! Alright, so these two knuckleheads are in my living room. I don't know that they're going to actually contribute anything to this program, but Yay! I invited them to come over, and they, this episode is being recorded in front of a live studio audience. So if you're wondering who these strangers are in the background, or why I have these two people in the background, that's why. Um, I was carjacked. Yeah, right. You're right. I, he, I, he was brought here against his own will. I'm here to talk smack about paying tolls to drive roads for the next two hours. I, I love that I'm doing this episode and Alps is sitting next to me because now for the next two hours he can get angry at me for all the tolls I've paid. I'm to, not angry. To just, make this webinar possible. I'm just amused that you willingly pay tolls. So that's, See, that's but I'm, I, am, I am amused that you willingly go like miles out of your way to avoid paying them. I came so, here with that while paying a toll, you know. Well, it's, yeah, but it's a little hard to. That'd be a lot of miles. Out yeah, of yeah. There's limits. Um, I mean, it's house without paying a toll, so there's that. That's a lot easier to do. Yeah, I would agree. Um, so Mr. Albert is here. Jeff is here. When was the last time you were here for an episode? It's been it's a while. Been few years i don't think i made it here last year it must have been i don't, year before. I don't remember the last time you were here for a show and yeah, yeah it had to be something about jersey or pennsylvania something i knew because outside of that i don't like, really know anything well i really don't know what you're doing here one, one thing, <laughs> one, i spent two days in texas in my life and they were not in the houston area so that, that's how much i'm going to contribute to this show one, all right yeah one thing we know about by living in new jersey is we we know our toll roads so we'll have we'll have a lot of comparison to do here such as how much how much more effort texas puts into signing its toll roads than new jersey does i use a credit card and i don't pay other cash than, so other that. than our two this is, this is, tell us about this. Well, the, what do you want me to tell you about? The announcements? We could do that. No, the, the shields. The Fort Bend Parkway toll road. Um, it's a difference between Harris County and Fort Bend County, which we will wow. discuss in, when we get the show going. I want to drive where you have those shields. I want to go back. Uh, <laughs> I think you could photograph these two spots without having to pay a toll. Right. So. Yeah. But I'm fascinated by that, that Fort Bend Parkway shield. Never seen anything like that before. It, that's actually one of the only signs in existence where it has Fort Bend Tollway. It's usually Fort Bend Toll Road. But for whatever reason, it says Tollway. That's the, I think that's the only one of those I've seen. I would, please tell our viewers where to find this. I don't know off the top of my head. Boo. <laughs> Clearly, it's, it's right by the county line, so we could probably figure that out. All right. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's do some announcements while we, while we wait for people to file in. So, um, YouTube channel, I'm uploading, I think, I think I'm still in I-25 in Colorado. That's what's coming out right now. There will be new content from, actually, the winter trip in... February, starting on March 17th, I think. Channel members might see it a few days prior to that. We'll have to wait and see what happens there. Um, don't forget to spring your clocks ahead one hour tonight, also, by the way, as daylight savings time begins. Right? It begins, right? Yes. Yeah. So... Did you find that? Thing? Yeah. Well, all right. Very it's nice. It's on the uh, it's on the frontage road for uh, eight, Sam Houston Tollway on the southwest oh. corner okay. of Houston and the county. I, do, do you 
told me what I needed to do to find it. So. Well, I figured this picture would kind of narrow it down. Go, a go bit. clinch Highway 8. Don't pay the toll. Clinch Highway 8 counterclockwise and you'll find it. Yes, Beltway 8. Clockwise, that's right. Yeah. Clinch clockwise. Yeah. Very important. Um, so we got the spring forward thing out of the way, and then... Um, but I would imagine that this PowerPoint will end somewhat early tonight, so I will spend some time at the end of this PowerPoint discussing our season finale. And there's a few parameters that you folks out there in the audience should be aware of. There are multiple live streams involved with that program, so you will have to stick around for that. Because of course you're interested in what we're doing next week, obviously. Um, all right. The announcements were very easy this week. Let's see here. All right. It's 6.06. .06. I think we can start. So good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar presentation. Tonight is part two of our two-part series on Houston and Southeast Texas. Um... Last episode, if you weren't with us, we discussed the freeways, the interstates, um, and a couple of other uh, odds and ends. Tonight, we're going to focus mainly on the tollway system and the, uh, the system of highways that are operated by the Harris County Toll Road Authority. So there are some toll bridges, and there's a tunnel mixed in there, and there's also a ferry mixed in there that we'll be mentioning along the way. So and a lot of phallic symbols on the shields. <sighs> Sure, if you want to call it that. I mean, you squint a little and you can't unsee it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to be that's, partaking that's, in that. That's Texas for you. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, we discussed previously um, the overview of the city of Houston on last week's episode, so I won't go into any detail as far as that's concerned. I will refer back to the episode from last week. Because I don't really want to repeat myself. Um, one of the ten largest cities in America, one of the ten largest metro areas um, in the United States. And yet they can't support a hockey team. Uh, it's funny you mention that, because that is the next slide. Yeah. Um, or a baseball team that doesn't cheat. Oh, oh, oh. Well, in this country, cheating is valued and respected, as we know, so... Moving on. I was going to say, um, NHL is rumored to be potentially interested in the Houston market uh, if they ever expand beyond 32 teams. Um, Houston is a possibility. Salt Lake is another one that's been tossed about. Even a third try at Atlanta. Uh, not, you laugh, but... I, I do laugh. <laughs> they, they are looking at Atlanta again, yeah. And I think there's one or two others that have been mentioned. But if the NHL does a major expansion, I would not be surprised if Houston is a place where you find a team at some point in the near future. Go Arrows! Other than that, I think I covered the pro and collegiate sports history of Houston pretty well last week. Uh, I will certainly not be talking about the flaming thumbtacks for the second week in a row, so you are spared of my rant against them. The flaming thumbtacks being your team or the other team? Uh, I'm talking about these guys here. Your team, okay. Yeah. You may rant against you, your team all you wish. I, I, if you pay attention, you know that I do. So I, I always appreciate that. Yeah, well, you know... As a fan of the one worst team in the NFL... Well, that actually, that actually wasn't true. The Jets had a better record last year. Yeah, but we're definitely the worst team. Well, yeah, okay. As a quick refresher, I will bring up our maps of present-day Houston Metro. We discussed the, uh, the genesis of the freeway system on last week's episode, so all the historical maps of the area you can find on the slides from the Part 1 presentation. Uh, which again is available um, at the link in the description of this video. But anyway, just as a quick recap, we have the place where the major mainline interstates converge right downtown, so I-10, I-45, and I-69, which is a direct overlap of uh, the U.S. 59 freeway. 
which was conceived in the late 1950s. Um, the interstate designation along that corridor is a relatively recent development. Mm. But of course you already knew that because you've already watched last week's episode. Mm, if we take a wider view of the metro area, here you can, un you can see and understand just how massive uh, Houston Metro has become. Uh, especially in the last 20 years, I would say. Um, so many beltways. We, we need a scale bar here, but yes, Houston has succeeded at winning most beltways for a single city. Uh, there is actually going to be a scale of the Grand Parkway on a prominent part of the country yeah. in a little while, and you'll you'll get to see just how massive the Grand Parkway is. Yeah. but I, I feel like Rhode Island would fit inside Beltway 8. <laughs> Uh, it might be close, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Certainly by land area, yeah. But yeah, so Houston is the land of the three beltways. We talked about the 610 at length um, last yeah. week. And we have Beltway 8 slash Sam Houston Tollway as the second loop. And then the third loop is the Grand Parkway, mm -hmm. Highway 99. There's a second and a half loop there. Six goes down the west side, but it goes around the north. I don't know what you're talking about. It's not a full freeway, but it's a. Well, road that, yeah, but we're not. That yeah, loops yeah but no, no one cares. So I care. <laughs> we're here to talk about freeways and toll. And you roads. could also use downtown as the first loop in the town. Five. I mean, you could, yeah. You count five loops here if you want to. Yeah, I but I. I the land of loops. I think I'm going to count three of them. I think so. you're loopy. I yeah. think I'm loopy. Yeah, I think that's more accurate. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Okay, so here is where we diverge onto completely new territory. So, I want to give a brief overview of the toll road system in Houston. And on this map, what I really like about it is that it not only highlights all the different tolled facilities in Houston, but it also breaks them out into the individual um, authorities that operate the mileage of the system. So, we have this very complicated and color-coded thing here and I'm gonna break this down as simple as I can um, everything that you see that's highlighted in purple is operated by the Harris County Toll Road Authority they were the first tolling authority for Metro Houston be, to be established they were established in the early 1980s we'll talk more about that in a few minutes why that even came to pass in the first place but Harris County Toll Road Authority or HECTRA as they are known um, they operate as you see, the Hardy Toll Road in the north, the Sam Houston Tollway, uh, parts of the uh, I-10 Tollway lanes west of town, uh, most of the West Park Tollway to the west, and the northern end of the Fort Bend Tollway. Now, in light blue, you'll see, you know, around the uh, north of town, you know, most of the Grand Parkway, the Told express lanes on 288, those are operated by Texas DOT. That's what light blue denotes. Um, orange, again, mostly in the southwest, that is Fort Bend County. Changes at the county line. It Part does. It does. Uh, Fort Bend County Toll Road Authority, or Fabuctra. <laughs> um, in green here, this is Brazoria County, yeah. or Bictra. Uh, and you notice how there's this little bit of pink up here. That is Montgomery County, or Mictra. Um, so you got all these counties that have their own individual toll road authorities. And that is, that's because this is Texas, and it's completely <laughs> stupid. But uh, that's the way that they've decided to roll with this thing, and that's what we have to deal with. I would like to mention... You notice these red lines on here. <clears throat> Most of the freeways in Houston have reversible uh, high occupancy toll express lanes in the median. Um, so that's what these lines are showing. They're showing you where those lanes are. So those are also tech stop, but they're in red instead of blue because it's only the median lanes, not the whole road. Lane. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Whereas you put in purple on 10 because even though it's only the median lanes... It's operated by Harris County, so you want to highlight that. It's operated by Harris County, and they also consider that a separate highway for administrative you know it's purposes. In the okay. Yeah. So I think that's the difference cool. there. So you got all these different tolling authorities operating all these different highways. So this 
that's your uh, that's your bird's eye. Last last question. Yes. What do the yellow dots represent? Um, I think they represent. I believe so. I'm, I'm thinking that would main line and the, just the the regular colored dots are the exits. Um, yes. Exits with ramp tolls, right, probably. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I, I would. I, I think that's fair. Yeah. This was taken off of the Hectra site, so this is why it doesn't do the same treatment for the other right. systems. But yeah, I, I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we're going to start our look with the second loop around Houston, and this is the highway that really gave rise to the notion of creating a tolling authority for Metro Houston. So the Sam Houston Tollway is about 88 miles in total. It forms the second loop around the suburbs of Houston. Uh, what's interesting to know about this highway is that parts of it are known as um, Beltway 8 or Sam Houston Parkway, and the toll lanes are simply denoted with Sam Houston Tollway Shields. There are a few sections of the loop that are not tolled. Those sections are highlighted in red on this map. Those sections are signed uh, on the freeway as Beltway 8. It's a state highway designation. It's the only state highway in Texas with a Beltway prefix. As far as why the number 8 was chosen, I don't know. Um, there doesn't appear to be any significant reason behind the number 8. Um, but eight was chosen nonetheless, and so that's that's the end of that story. So, and, and when not on the freeway, when not for all the green parts, eight is on the frontage road. I was just going to say that. Yep. Yeah. So, so it forms a beltway. So Beltway Eight is a true circle. It just depends on whether the highway is told or not. That determines where the state highway is, whether it's on the main lanes or on the frontage roads. The one exception to this, I would assume, is the bridge over the Houston Ship Channel. Lower right? Yeah, that would be over here. Right, it would have to merge in. And... I would think, unless it just, unless it isn't. But That's I cool. would, I think, I think it, it does exist even though it's unsigned. Yeah, so the loop um, actually came to life first with the construction of the uh, what was then originally known as the Beltway 8 Toll Bridge, or what is known today simply as the Houston Ship Channel Bridge. It was conceived in the 1960s because even as the 610 loop was taking shape, there was a realization that suburban sprawl was happening at such a high rate that the simple bypass that 610 provided would no longer be adequate. 610 would basically be in the middle of the city at the rate that it was expanding. And that's kind of how it played out, especially on the western side of the metro. So planning began for a second loop outside of the 610 loop. And what they arrived at was basically the highway that was constructed today. However, the original obstacle was funding. It was not included in the interstate highway system, which meant that the state was responsible for its construction. The state didn't have the money to fund it. They tried to pass it off to the city of Houston and to Harris County to build it as a toll-free facility. However, Harris County didn't have the money to build it as such either. This led in the 1970s and 80s to a push to create a new uh, toll agency uh, that would construct, operate, and maintain this highway. Um, there, there was another project that was in planning stages around the same time, a relief route for I-45, uh, that was being planned that they wanted to have built as well but there wasn't funding to build that project either so what ended up happening was in 1983 a proposal was put be before voters at a referendum uh, to approve the creation of a Harris County Toll Road Authority which was passed in a special election the election result released $900 million in bonds to fund the construction of two highways, the Sam Houston Tollway being one and the Hardy Toll Road being the other. Those were the first two highways to come to life under the operation of the Harris County Toll Road Authority, which in southeastern Texas is often pronounced like Hectra. Um, construction on this highway then began in the latter part of the 1980s, the, toll, the Sam Houston Tollway, that is. 
Uh, parts of it were opened in stages. Uh, the final piece of it in the northeast of the metro was completed in 2011. Interestingly, the northeastern part feeds into what was the original section of what was incorporated into the tollway, which was the north approach to the Beltway 8 toll bridge. Um, the toll bridge itself was built in the late 1970s. Construction was completed in 1982 over the, uh, the Houston Ship Channel. Uh, at the time of its completion, the bridge was the longest uh, reinforced concrete box girder span in the Western Hemisphere a title that it held until 1997 when the Confederation Bridge opened in Canada. Uh, the bridge was... This, so this bridge was originally an independent venture. It was not intended to be part of any sort of belt highway. Uh, it was a project that was undertaken by what was then known as the Texas Turnpike Authority, which nowadays it got absorbed into the North Texas Tollway Authority. That's sort of the successor um, agency. Um, so they kind of built this bridge on their own, and what became the Sam Houston Tollway Loop was incorporated into the toll bridge later. <clears throat> As we scroll through some pictures here, I have more. I have a lot more to say about this bridge in a moment, but I want to... I want to point out on this slide here, you notice how you can tell when you're on a free section of the highway because you have Bellway 8 shields overhead on the free section and you have Hectra shields overhead on the told section. It's a very easy way for you to tell and they do a pretty decent job of signing when the toll section begins and when it ends and stuff I'm like that. presuming that right as the toll section begins, the exit says Bellway 8 to... Like, no, I, I don't, I don't, like, on the exits, it doesn't sign Beltway 8, but it does say last exit before toll. Okay, so you just have to know, drop to the frontage road there to follow 8. Yeah. For those I mean, of us in the, uh, in the hobby here who want to drive all of the 8, yeah. you have to keep careful eye on that. Right. Uh, let's see here. Okay, now... Construction of the Bellway 8 toll bridge in the 1980s was quite a forward-thinking proposal because it, it provided another fixed crossing of the ship channel well to the east of the metro, or what was then really the extent of the metro. But as the years went on uh, and sprawl encroached further and further out this way, uh, the existing bridge really became inadequate to handle the traffic. Furthermore, the existing bridge is actually not considered to be tall enough to handle modern shipping, which is becoming ever larger as they continue to try to access ports and port facilities further inland. So discussions were uh, held in the 2010s and construction began in 2018 on a replacement bridge, which you can see here in this picture in 2023, they haven't gotten very far. And unfortunately there is a reason for that. The replacement bridge was designed by the FIG Engineering Group um, and their contractor was a joint venture led by Trailer Brothers and Zachary Construction. Uh, the bridge was originally planned to be completed in 2024. Um, obviously as you can see that's not going to happen. Uh, construction was halted in December of 2021 uh, for almost two years in fact. Uh, because of design errors that were discovered uh, as the construction of the main span was getting underway. After a thorough design review, a couple of things happened. One is that the original designer was kicked off the project. The second was that because the design miscalculations were so severe, uh, they had to basically demolish what they had built of the main span and start over again. These delays and setbacks have meant that the completion of this bridge has been pushed back to at least 2028, if wow. not later than that. Um, it's worth noting that this is not the only bridge on the Gulf Coast of Texas that has had very um, fatal design flaws uh, come to the surface. In fact, a similar cousin bridge to this one um, down in Corpus Christi, Texas on US 181, the New Harbor Bridge, uh, was designed by the same lead design firm and 
fatal errors were discovered in that bridge as well, and that bridge was shut down for multiple years as well for pretty much eerily similar reasons. Um, and so that's where we stand as far as that's concerned. Question for you. Um, from this perspective that you show, this bridge looks like it's only taking traffic going in this direction. Were they going to yeah. convert the existing bridge to the opposite direction only, or were they going to open the new bridge and then put all traffic on this and replace the old one? No, they, so what's what you're seeing here is the construction of the first of two parallel spans. Okay, so they're going to get the new one open, put everyone on that, yeah. then replace the existing, and then they'll be done. Okay. Yeah, the, so the second parallel span will go basically in the footprint of the existing bridge. When you say 2028, is that just for this first bridge, or is that for both of them? Well, that would be for both of them. Okay. Um, they are hoping they can get the first span operational in 2025. Thank you. Um I still think that's a pretty aggressive timeline, 2028, because you also have to factor in that you have to completely remove the existing bridge in order to make way for the new one. What would you know about doing that? Absolutely nothing. Okay. <laughs> I actually, so as a little bit of an aside, I, I know people, I worked with people with Tap and Z Constructors who were... They finished. They finished up the main span work on the tap right around the time that this was originally starting in 2018, and I know people who went down there, and they were saying, "Oh, it's going to be this awesome project," and yeah. they had no idea what was waiting for them. It's I an know awesome that. project, all right. Yeah, well, it's an awesome mess, is what it's turned into. Um, it's awesome thing. Uh, yeah, but apparently they are back on track now both in Houston with this bridge and in Corpus Christi with the Harbor Bridge. Uh, so so how much higher is this new bridge going to be compared to the existing I, I think it's going to be substantial. Um, this is what it's going to look like. Um, you can understand why the design of a main span is so important because of how intricate things are once you get above deck level in a situation like this. Um, now, when they when they demolished what was built of the main span, they had not reached deck level yet with the towers. But that's, still, that's that's a. I mean, you're talking about eight or nine thousand psi concrete in those foundations. When I was so looking at both the existing bridge and what they have actually built, there's no evidence of cable stayed whatsoever. So I had no idea that this is actually they're planning a cable stayed that mm -hmm. looks like the way Tappanzi should have looked, but. It's it, it's very striking, isn't it? it, it I like the I like the, the X on top. Yeah, it, it, I don't I don't think there's ever been a bridge that looks quite like that. Because they're going to build this in two pieces, meaning the second piece we're going to have to marry the two towers to each other to be yeah. unified. Yeah. Like up at the top, you're yeah. going to have the W shape, so they'll have to join them at the top, which is going to be. I thought we weren't getting political today. <laughs> <laughs> Texas oh, this, wants this, a W shape? What? Oh, this bridge will be named for George W. Bush. Oh, God. You know? So it makes perfect sense. Could be HW. Uh, it could be. By the time this opens, yeah. Well, it'll, be a, it'll be 100, so... Yeah, right. And what a burn. Um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, just stick a <laughs> stick a billboard at the top of the center. <laughs> it's just got the... Do that's got no, the light it up, on light it up it. in red every night. Just the W part in red and... Yeah. Um, yeah, so that is the deal. Um, the saga of this project has obviously taken a lot of years to get through and there are still several more years ahead but um, unfortunately engineers are not infallible and mistakes happen and when they do we need to do the best we can to isolate the problem and correct it and go through protocol to make sure that we don't have this happen again and unfortunately Fortunately and unfortunately, right? Unfortunately, this has happened, and it's caused two very prominent multi-billion dollar projects to be derailed completely. Uh, the fortunate thing is that in the case of both projects, it appears that the problems that were fatal were discovered uh, before they became literally fatal to the traveling public. Um, so if there is a silver lining in all this, it's the fact that we caught the mistake early enough that we could fix it. It's just going to cost more money in the end. I, I'd be curious for more of a story there. It's up to you what you want to tell, but as we're watching the videos, maybe that beats a little more time today. So, Well, what do you want to know? Um, I, I, 
being an engineer, I'm interested to hear exactly what they discovered that was uh, designed incorrectly about all of this. I, I know more about the issues with Corpus Christi than I do with this one. Um, but I know from what I've read about Houston that there were issues with the foundation load capacity. And that there wasn't enough rebar built into it or, or something along those lines. Oh, okay. Um, with Corpus Christi, there were more issues with the, the A-frames where the cable comes from the tower and uh, ties into the deck. So that one was going to be cables ripping off the frames. This one Basically, was going to be the bridge collapsing onto the foundations. More or less, yeah. Interesting. And, yeah, so it, it, it's... Which I find interesting because it's the same design firm, so... Like don't I would I would have thought that the issues would have been basically the same between the two, but these two bridges are not the same the way that they're designed. Um, the the Corpus Christi one has more of a Sunshine Skyway layout where the cables run right down the center line of the deck. Mm -hmm. This is more of a fanning out and going out to both edges of the deck, so it's not quite the same uh, situation. Is one eighty one a text dot free bridge, or is that also toll? Uh, there's not going to be a toll on the 181. Okay. So you that is safe for you to drive. Well, no, but it's a, <laughs> it's a difference of who's ordering the bridge, what goes into it, which two different fatal issues found for two very different bridges because it's not the same authority going after them. And one is funded by public money, one is funded by toll money. And two, yeah. a, a toll agency inherently does things a little differently than a public agency that's funded by taxpayer money in terms of where their priorities lie, what they're willing to work with, all of that. So it's, it's, it's interesting to hear this story. I think that the, the Houston situation developed first. That's what tipped off Texas DOT about Corpus Christi. Hmm. Um, and I believe it was Hectra who waved the red flag. So the client was very much on top of it. Um, I think it was them who voiced concern first yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah they have been a very uh, proactive client throughout this whole process which I have to say that's that is not always the case I'll, I'll say that much um, but yeah so new designer in place um, the, the actual dimensions of this bridge did not change post redesign um, it was a matter of reinforcing what was already there so the bridge that the renderings from 2018 still stand as the renderings for uh, today. And those are the renderings that you see on your screen here. It's going to be a hell of a bridge to drive through when it's done, I have to say, as we already mentioned. It's a very, it's a very unique looking structure and it's monumental, certainly. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure the people who are down there are looking forward to it being done. Looking forward to a Houston road meet when this thing gets ready to open. Well, you know, you, you could do that. Well, I can't. Well, I, you'll just have to ride in the passenger seat, so you don't have to pay the toll. No, I, I would need somebody who lives there to, to organize this. Well, I organized a road meet on the Gulf Coast recently, and I didn't live down there. You, you, you're you honorary Gulf Coast. Honorary Gulf? Well, I guess you could say that. I am not volunteering myself for this, by the way, by saying that. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Let us know when. Uh, stay tuned to the AA Roads Forum, everybody. <clears throat> okay, so next up, moving on from the Tollbridge saga. So remember how we were talking about how Hectra came to be. There were two highways that they wanted to build that they needed funding for. This was the second of the two highways. The Hardy Toll Road, which is it's known as such because it roughly parallels the Hardy Street corridor on the north side of Houston. Um, it serves basically as a relief route for I-45. It kind of shadows it a few miles to the east of it. Um, it does provide the most direct access to the terminals of Bush Intercontinental Airport. Um, mm -hmm. However, if you're looking to not pay a toll, there are other ways to get in there that don't involve going this way. Um, construction of the Hardy began in 1984 uh, and was completed in 1988. Um, 
let's see here. I mentioned that it is named for Hardy Street. Oh, the other thing that I want to mention, um, if you like, so a lot of road enthusiasts, there's a lot of crossover in road enthusiasm, and there can be um, interest also in railroads amongst the road community. Well, the, uh, the Hardy Toll Road might interest you if that's the case, if you happen to like trains and all that, because chances are you will see an active Union Pacific uh, train somewhere along the course of this highway along your journey. Active Union Pacific Railroad tracks uh, lie in the median of this highway uh, on its southern half. Um, it, this is not an this is not the only example of this. There are a couple others that come to mind uh, off the top of my head anyway. Um, the Mopac Expressway in Austin, Texas is another example of this. Uh, there's a section of the Broken Arrow Expressway in Tulsa, Oklahoma that has a similar layout as well. But it is kind of neat that you have the roadway split outside and you have this active double-track railroad line running right down the middle of the right-of-way. DC area says hello also. Uh, if you want to incorporate mass transit, you have a bunch of other options That's too. Yeah. It counts. Yeah. Philly has one train station. Uh, yeah, there is that one station on 95, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see here. So, ever since the 90s, there has been discussion of building a southern extension of the Hardy into downtown. This project has been known off and on as the Hardy Connector. Um, construction of it was... Kind of, they kind of got started a few years ago on utility relocation, but because of the major ten billion dollar downtown overhaul that we talked about last week, um, construction on it hasn't actually begun because they want to finalize exactly where these new highways are going to go. So as I forty five is now relocated around the wet, the east and the north quadrants of downtown Houston. This now gives designers a lot more understanding of where these highways are going to go, and I believe that the Hardy Connector will move forward as part of this larger uh, downtown remake. Um, obviously, the Hardy Connector will be funded by Hectra, but so it'll be separate from the Texas DOT $10 billion that they're spending. Uh, but the Hardy Toll Road will likely be extended into downtown Houston within the next decade or so as part of that. So stay tuned on that. <clears throat> okay when I put my notes together I did not put these roads in order for some reason because I'm an idiot alright had trouble finding that for a second you were, you were a fearless leader and well somebody's got to do it because I know you two aren't going to do it yeah I don't know <laughs> I'm willingly follow. Um, all right, West Park. I have to say, before we go any further, uh, the West Park Toll Road is easily my favorite tollway drive in Houston, um, and I'll explain why that is in a moment as we go along here. So, as far back as the 1960s. The West Park section of West Houston was one of the fastest growing suburbs in the region. And the section of, there, there's a strip of land that's been used by railroads for decades. And it was originally a freight rail corridor. And for the last 50 years or so, the city of Houston and local authorities have considered introduction of mass transit onto this corridor that roughly shadows West Park Drive. Um, what you see here, which was completed in 2004, is the West Park Tollway, which was built as actually the first all-electronic toll road in the United States. Um, it was never, there were never any toll plazas. It was always uh, electronic tag collection only. Um, the tollway actually begins out west in Fort Bend County. So this is where, this is where this starts to get weird, because you have the same road that is maintained by two different agencies depending on what side of the county line you're on and depending on what side of the county line you're on you will see different shields for the highway 
So, of course, we have the two of them on the top right of your screen. You have the Harris County Shield, which looks a lot like a purple county root shield, right? And the uh, this rather interesting arrow-like uh, mm -hmm. shield that Fort Bend County has adopted. A um, little bit of a difference in the name or the nomenclature between the two. I've always... I, I made an executive decision when putting together this webinar just to refer to this highway as the West Park Tollway, but in Fort Bend County they like to add extra words just to make more syllables for my teeth to have to pronounce. And they make it look like a uh, Major League Soccer logo. Uh, it, it kind of... It... Red, red, white, and blue, that, that, that diamond Oregon shield shape. Oh, yeah, I had to put that Texas star in there. Very soccer. Very <laughs> yeah, right. soccer. Yeah. The overall length of the tollway is 22 miles between its sections in Harris and Fort Bend counties. Um, and they need to replace their sign. Um, so what was interesting about this road, too, and I don't... Do I have any pictures of this? I do. Yeah. This is what you want to see. Um, when the tollway was completed in 2004, um, the exit signage on the West Park was not your standard green background. It was purple background uh, because Hectra was experimenting with a different uh, presentation for its toll roads. Um, because the MUTCD stepped in, because they are the commissioners of the No Fun League and demanded uh, compliance across the board, these signs have been phased out. So this picture on your lower right was actually taken in 2018 on my first oh, visit to Houston. All gone now? Yeah, there's no more purple signage. Nope. Oh, that's... <laughs> purple signs are supposed to be used for... You may use the purple background if it's for an exit that goes to a toll facility. It is included in the MTCD, but I guess that's well, to get onto one, not to exit one. But it's, it's, it, it's a standard exit off of to a regular street no but you're so on it's... a toll right so it, i think that's the issue here is that you're already on the tollway if yeah. makes it to get onto the tollway theoretically you could sign that as purple like yeah okay i don't i or maybe you could sign this as purple also i would have to delve into the new mutcd toll road section to see exactly what it says about the use of purple signs which given that we're on this webinar i will now do that all right, well, you do that. My understanding is that they modified the regulations so that you couldn't do something like this. Um, but that's I, I think that that rule remains in place for line striping. Like, to denote, like, there are examples in the Northeast, I think, where the, where you stripe a lane with purple also yes. to denote, like, easy pass only or yes. something like that. But that's, that's different say, than signs. Yeah, yeah, US 1 crossing the Delaware Mountain. River, I think, has that. I Use think, of color yeah. purple on any sign shall comply. Purple as a background color shall be used only when the information associated with the appropriate ETC account is displayed on that portion of the sign. The background color of the remainder of the sign is supposed to be normal. So purple shall not be used as a color to display a destination action message or other legend that is not a display of the requirement for all vehicles to have an ETC account. Yeah, that's the difference. That's they what have, changed. Yeah, yeah, that is the current edition, 2023, just issued. You can only use purple for what you see in the background on the screen here for the easy tag. That's the only yeah. place you're allowed to use purple. And I think that they just decided, or Hector at least, just decided to abandon it because that's a relatively low number of signs that they would use that for. I, and... I honestly wouldn't be surprised if this road was used by the... FHWA to decide to disallow this. It's possible, you know, because it it, w it would make sense on a number of levels. Because this highway was really a, a guinea pig in multiple ways, yeah. if that's the case. Being the first completely electronic toll road, it was one, and then they may have decided to do a trial run with right. signs like this and just if, to and, see what would happen. And yeah. people from FHWA may have ridden it once it was open and determined that this purple color may be confusing because once you're on the road you're looking for an exit green is the standard and so they decided no you can't do this yeah so i think that the the purple is not just it's for toll collection in general right it's not just it's not for automated or anything along those lines i think it's just like a flat 
this is a this is an exit for a toll road of some sort. Right. Uh, yeah. It doesn't distinguish between cash collection and electronic right. collection. I li- I like this idea, and there's there's one reason that I like this because toll agencies almost always do not get any federal funding, and the penalty for non-compliance with the MUTCD is pulling federal funding. So toll agency could simply have said, okay, we're breaking the rule, you don't get to fund us, and not lose anything from that. that. But yeah. that they, I will say this is not the only time that a toll agency has made a conscious decision to simply go with MUTCD, even even <laughs> if they lose nothing from it, they made that decision. So, uh, I will not name the agency that you're referring to. Well, no, I I, <laughs> I don't mind naming the agency I'm referring to no, because right. they've... You can do that if you want. Yeah, because they, they've chosen to better follow federal standards. I don't think that's a negative mark anywhere, but it's just interesting yeah. to see toll agencies do that when they very well could get away with not and have nothing to lose. Yeah, because Hectra is completely self-sufficient. Yeah. So, it, exactly. yeah, they could have exactly. just said, oh, I see what you're doing there. Too bad. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, they, they did decide to adopt the METCD standard, so... I don't know about all the politics that went on behind closed doors, but that's basically what happened. Um... So the corridor that we're mentioning here along West Park Drive has a long history of proposals for mass transit of any sort. I alluded to this a couple minutes ago. Um, As far back as the 1950s, even. Um, But more recently, the, 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 the opportunity to develop this as a transit corridor was the strongest in the 1990s. Uh, failed referendums around 1990 and 1991 that would have enabled funding for the construction of a commuter rail line along this corridor um, came and went. Uh, It was eventually decided in the late 90s, uh, since there was no movement on the construction of any sort of rail corridor, that Hectra agreed to purchase parts of the right-of-way for the construction of a toll road. So we have mass transit being passed over in favor of more cars. (laughs) Which is a very Texan thing to have <laughs> yeah. happen, right? Very. Um, so this is this is kind of a microcosm of the Brit, of the broader <laughs> problem that Houston Metro has, which is that they really don't have a reliable mass transit system. Uh, so when you have 2.3 million people within Houston city limit uh, with no reliable transit options, you get some of the worst traffic in the United States. And Houston certainly does not disappoint as far as that's concerned. I'm surprised with the number of freeways they have that that's the case. I am and, not and, I'm not surprised because there are 2.3 million people and it's over seven in the metro area. You were the one who was just there, so you'd know better, but in my few trips down to Houston, I never hit a spot of traffic. I want to. I want to know what. No, <laughs> I want to know what your secret is. To be clear, <laughs> there were times when I was leaving the city during the PM rush hour, and what was considered traffic was it was slowing down to like forty-five or fifty instead of the usual eighty. Far from the worst traffic that I have to deal with on a routine basis. Mm. I never saw a stop and go at all in Houston. Maybe mm. directly downtown because I wasn't downtown, but the commuting routes seemed. It seems like there's enough different commuting routes, and as the regular roads get congested, you have the toll road network for people willing to pay to get around the traffic. That uh, <laughs> I, I think the way they've developed this is exactly with that in mind to have these relief routes, and we've seen from your photos they're relatively well used to balance traffic between these. So I'm surprised yeah. to hear you talk about traffic. I really have not witnessed it to yeah. be that bad. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you're right about the relief route thing. I will say um, anywhere except the east side, that new bridge that they're building, that can get stop and go. Yeah, that's that's the one part of the Sam Houston loop that routinely backs up, yeah. That, but that you can I've understand seen, why that would be the case. Yeah. That I've seen get very bad. Um, but yeah, it, 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 the, the tollways generally move well. Um, they are kept at a free-flowing condition because of the toll rates that are charged. Um, constant or variable, or does it depend? It is. It's constant, but okay. it's high enough to where at any time of the day, it's a lot of people just choose not to use them. But I think that that's also part of the point: is that you need to also have a reliable way to get around the metro that 
will be free flowing the vast majority of the time, barring incidents mm-hmm. or what have you. Um, I mentioned that the West Park Tollway is my favorite uh, Houston Tollway drive, and views like this are why that's the case. This is taken from the flyover ramp connecting the eastbound West Park with northbound Southwest Freeway, US 59. Um, and you can see here is this is the area that's known as Uptown Houston. This is along I 610. And way in the distance here on a clear day, you can see the skyscrapers of downtown Houston <laughs> looming off in the distance. So you kind of get a false downtown impression with, is there with what's in the foreground of here. Emissions issues from having all these highways that would lead to the downtown being foggy like that? So I, I think we mentioned this last week, but Houston is like perpetually in this really humid, yeah. hazy yeah. backdrop. Um, this is actually the clearest I think I've ever seen downtown from this vantage point. So it's just, yeah. it, it's position on the Gulf. It's a very humid area anyway. Um, and of course, yeah. you know, all the people in their cars and whatnot, the air quality has gotten a lot better in recent years, but still it's, it's not ideal, but um, yeah, so this is one of my favorite views in the whole uh, metro area. Uh, let's see here. Moving on. Let's see. Fort Bend Toll Road. Um, in order for us to talk about the Fort Bend Toll Road, we need to talk about a once planned and as of this moment unbuilt Houston Freeway. Um, the origins of this highway date back to the years of the 1960s when as the 610 loop was being completed there was a plan that was put forth to build a highway leading southward from the far southwest corner of the 610 loop so this would be if you're looking at it on a map this is where the post road exit comes in and you notice at that interchange that there are high speed flyovers at that location and that is because they were built as placeholders for what was planned to be a freeway extension to the south and to the southwest into Fort Bend County. This project, which was known on planning maps for a number of years as the Bay City Freeway, was unbuilt, it was abandoned, but it was resurrected um, after its original 1979 cancellation as a potential addition to the tollway system in the 1980s. Um, it received an, a tentative designation of Texas Highway 122 in 1988. Um, construction of it did not begin until the 2000s, however. Uh, Fort Bend County uh, residents, similarly to what happened with Harris County residents, voted in a referendum in the year 2000 to approve a $140 million bond issued to support the creation of the Fort Bend County Toll Road Authority, or FBUCTRA, as we know it as, uh, today. Um... And this was to support the construction of what became the Fort Bend Toll Road and the western extension of the West Park Tollway, which was at the time still proposed. At the time that this was completed, the 122 designation was removed because it was no longer a Texas DOT project. It was passed over to Fort Bend County. Um, construction of... The initial sections of it began in 2003 and opened in 2004. Uh, Harris County saw what was going on and decided that they wanted to enter the mix and they wanted to extend the highway northward into Houston proper. Um, they were originally not interested in this project. They saw it as a endless money pit that Fort Bend County was just throwing money into because they didn't see the future prospects of suburban sprawl in the southwest of the metro, but boy, were they wrong about that. Um, so as soon as they saw what was happening on the, on the ground, they got involved and agreed to fund construction of the tollway inside the Sam Houston Loop, so north of Beltway 8 and in the direction of I-610. Uh, the five-mile extension inside the Fort Bend uh Five-mile extension northward from the uh, Beltway 8 was completed in the 2010s. Um, 
the tollway reached its final uh, current state in 2014. There is a short extension that is being built right now into Siena Village uh, that will extend its southern extremity by about a mile or so. It's not a very lengthy extension. Uh, but that is planned for completion by the end of 2024. Question for you. Yes. Is this coming up, or should we talk about all these toll roads that do not accept cash, How, if you're visiting the area, how you would pay that? We can talk about that now if you want. Uh, if you don't have it planned, I'd like to talk about that while we're looking at uh, at roads like this that are toll only. So you were able to travel it, so you prepared in advance. So I, I should preface this by saying that on my two visits to Houston, I was driving a rental car, so I think it's a little different. It's got the toll tag already in it. It already has the toll tag in it, and I think that with rental agencies, they have agreements with the authorities in this area that they'll just bill you by mail, whatever. Um, but it's my understanding that with the general population, it is tag only. And you will be, you will receive a violation for traveling in a tag only lane. Oh, so if I wanted to, <clears throat> if I'm driving to Houston and I want, and I know it's different for every road, for example, that Eastern Bridge may be more accessible to non-tag vehicles because there's no real alternative near it, but... Um, it, it can depend, but if I'm driving there in my own car, do I have ways to arrange for a temporary tag, or must I go through a full tag acquisition to be able to do this? I think it's a... So, the signage that you see around Houston says, easy tag only. Mm -hmm. um, that is not entirely true. It is tags that are compatible with easy tag. That's what they're really going for. Mm -hmm. But because everybody in Houston has easy tag, that's, that's just the convenient thing to put on the sign. Um, so you could navigate the Houston toll roads with, you know, K tag or Pike Pass in Oklahoma, but or, not Easy Pass, I assume. That's correct. All right, but but so they give you a couple of choices of interoperability. Yeah, so like if I was to drive these roads in my personal vehicle, I have a Texas tag that I could use. Right. So you would, would have to sign up fine. for some compatible tag. You'd have to look beforehand at which tags are compatible, sign up for one of them, obtain it before you leave, and then you'll have it in hand. That's right. From that point. Yep. yep. Okay. Is there just one main tag for the, all these different toll routes in Texas? Or do they have... Uh, it depends on the region of Texas. So Houston is easy tag. That's like the hit... That, that was the tag that was developed by Harris County and then it was adopted to mm -hmm. the broader Probably. region. Okay. As it, the other counties in Houston just adopted easy tag. Um, so easy tag is the Southeastern Texas model. There is a tag that's compatible statewide in Texas. That's known as Texas tag. Um, and if you're in the Dallas Fort Worth area, there's another one known as <laughs> toll tag. That is the NTTA or North okay. Texas Turnpike Authority. They have their own system up in North Texas. If you're going to Texas, my best advice to you would be to just get a Texas tag because it's compatible on any toll road in the state of Texas. You don't have to worry about this bullshit with easy tag not being compatible with NTTA, for instance. And no monthly fee. I, I don't know if that's true, but that would, <laughs> uh, that would yeah. be important. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, And it's also, in, in the case of um, easy tag, you can drive, you can... I think the Oklahoma Pike Pass is accepted here, and also the Kansas Turnpike's K tag is accepted here. So that greater central United States region. Yeah, that's right. They have their own interoperability corridor there. Yep, which is not yet interoperable with the states in the east, at least not yet. Well, yeah, as we work towards that, but yeah. Well, we're, we're settling. Honestly, we're settling on two compatibilities: Easy Pass for the Greater Northeast Region, and this Texas tag is pull, with the adjacent states that you mentioned, Oklahoma, Kansas, is kind of a second nexus of compatibility. And the key is going to be once those two become compatible, which is only a matter of time, California is just going to have to follow along. California is going to have to pick one of them. Yeah. No, they, they, once they're compatible, it doesn't matter. So. Well, yeah, I, I that's think, going to be. I think that's going to be the turning point once those two become compatible. I think I've mentioned that's this. the end of the road. That's yeah, the end of the road. yeah, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but it, national interoperability is inevitable. 
Yeah. It's just a question of what it looks like. Um, it's going to look like exactly what it's looked like to date, which is one by one. You say, oh, we're now compatible with this. Yeah, and I can absolutely see the regional toll tags remaining, but becoming interoperable with everything else. Right. Because you want, you still want to give the individual states the rights to give discounts to their in-state residents and customers. I think that's going to be a big part of the puzzle going forward. Which but, some people don't care for, but I mean, I've never seen a problem with that. Yeah, but I, I think that you will continue to have a billion different transponders. It's just that gradually more and more of them will cluster together. And then before you know it, you'll look up and you'll be like, oh, look, they're all accepted everywhere. You right. know, that's kind of, that's the future. Here. Right. Once we you get know. to that, then, then it's just going to gradually condense into a single tag. Or, yeah. Or well, a, few a, a few. Yeah. yeah it's not going to be yeah. a monopoly, but. Yeah. We're almost there. We're, we're, we've made a lot of progress just in the last few years. Yep. Yeah, and so imagine what the next five years is going to be like. Um, all right, so we are... Oh, we get to talk about Montgomery County now. Aren't we lucky? Hmm. Um, so I, you remember how I mentioned that sep, like single highways have like multiple agencies that oversee like a few miles at a time? Well, this is the most ridiculous example of this in Houston because you have three agencies within about a five-mile stretch of highway. Yeah. That's the pink one, right? That was the pink one that yeah. I showed you on the map a few moments ago, right? Um, the Tomball Tollway began life as the uh, at-grade Tomball Parkway, which has always been part of the State Highway 249 corridor since going back to the 1980s or so. Um, the highway, which was an at-grade boulevard originally, uh, became overloaded with traffic almost overnight because the national uh, headquarters of Compaq, which was later purchased <laughs> by Hewlett Packard, they decided to locate along the parkway. So I, I like that you mentioned the reason it's congested is Compaq. We're all here like... What's that? Where does he go? Yeah, well... <laughs> who are they anymore? You, you Gen Z and millennial people might not know who they are, but... Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's the, the Texas DOT had long had long-term plans to expand this highway into some sort of limited access facility. At the same time, there was a, a discussion at a state level about building some sort of a controlled access highway connecting Houston with College Station, which is a little more than an hour and a half northwest of Houston. Um, the influence of Texas A&M statewide had a lot to do with this, I would imagine. Um, but plans to build a freeway out to College Station never materialized due to funding issues. So, as you might predictably expect, this is where tolling agencies come into the mix. Um, the, the Tomball Tollway itself consisted of a freeway grade upgrade of the parkway from the, uh, just south of the Grand Parkway in the northwest part of the metro, northwesterly into Montgomery County. The first phase of this construction was completed in 2016. Uh, phase two of this upgrade was completed in 2019. At the same time this was going on, new plans were resurrected for a limited access highway to connect more directly with the College Station area. This section, this highway would be constructed as a toll road to be operated by Texas DOT. That said, Texas DOT was not too fe- kind, not too fond of the idea of building the entirety of the highway. They wanted the Houston Metro counties to get more involved in the funding for the construction of the highway, which meant that the only way this was going to happen was for Montgomery County, which is the neighboring county to Harris County, to get involved in the act themselves. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly what they did. They followed suit with Harris County and Fort Bend County and created MICTRA, or the Her- Montgomery County Toll Road Authority. And they oversee a less than five-mile section of this continuous highway. It's the same road. It's not... You know, you wouldn't notice necessarily that you're going between county lines at any point. You know, the road doesn't really change. But I find it very humorous and quite ridiculous that we have three different agencies maintaining a five-mile stretch of highway. Um, and so that is basically the deal. The Montgomery County section was com- was constructed beginning in 2018 and was completed in 2020. 
um, extending northward from Montgomery County beginning in 2020, construction in the direction of uh, College Station to its current northern terminus and a project that became known as the Aggie Expressway. That was the Texas DOT section of the highway or Texas DOT section of the project. That construction took place from 2018 until 2022. And in fact, these pictures of the Aggie Expressway were taken just a matter of weeks after it opened in early February of 2023. Go back, go back to sir. Oh, actually, no, you can see it here. Okay. Because um, the, the shields, you, you show on the right, shield with the white. Uh, yeah, at North 249 down there. That, right? That's got to be a goof. Because that's, <laughs> that's the only one of those that's out there. I love it. Yeah. Um... Even even the one that you see here doesn't look like it's white on the bottom. Um, this maybe, one is. This maybe. one is. Oh, it's know. a little hard to see, but yeah. yeah I, I see it now. Okay. So parts of the Aggie Expressway were constructed as a Super 2. Um, Texas DOT does occupy the right-of-way to expand the highway if necessary. Um, as of right now, uh, the Aggie Expressway ends at Highway 105, which is just a stone's throw away from Highway 6 which at that point is a freeway between there and College Station. So it's almost a full freeway drive between the two cities at this point. Question here mm -hmm. is the right, bottom right says end Texas 249, not toll. So did the tolls end before this point? Um, no. That's a goof then, okay. I suppose it is a goof, yeah. Yep. All right, we talked about the second loop around Houston. I think this is the last tollway we have to talk about. Um, that is the Grand Parkway, the third loop around Houston. Um, not yet a grand circle. It is basically a semicircle at this point. Um, it is intended to be a full loop at some point in the future, and if that becomes the case, it will be about 170 miles in length. Mm. Uh, it would easily become the longest uh, circumferential highway in the United States. Until Tennessee completes 840. Uh, well, I think we're going to be waiting a long time for that one, That too. semicircle would have outdone this one if it ever became a circle. Is that right? Yep. It's, it's... Well, you know, yeah, because the, the existing 840 is, what, 80 miles? Something like that? I, I just remember, so... it, it, I think it was going to outstrip this one by a little bit. Yeah, that, those plans we know are dead. So yeah, these, are, these are, are alive, which would give you a an even more eastern crossing, I guess, of, of the river there. Now, what I find really interesting is that, you know, planners are very forward-thinking people. And there are maps from as far back as the 1960s that show a limited access highway basically along the corridor that was built today. As far back as the 1960s, even. Uh, so these... The planners in the Houston Metro understood the potential of the Houston Metro. They understood where the development was going to happen in the ensuing 50 years or so. And they basically knew that this highway was going to be a, an inevitability at some point. Um, I want to point out a couple of things here. Um, so when the Grand Parkway was proposed and when it was built, this is this has all been constructed within the last two decades. Um, what you see highlighted in green on the map on the left, that has those are the projects that have been completed to this point. So sections D through I, 2A and 2B, those have all been completed and are now in service. Sections A, B and C remain to be constructed in the south of the metro at this point. Uh, segment B is the next segment that we will likely see construction on. That may start construction before the end of the decade, perhaps as early as 2027. That section would incorporate not only the limited access Grand Parkway, but also a freeway bypass of the city of Alvin, which has been loosely referred to as the Alvin Bypass Project. So that is kind of, that is on the table uh, at this point as well. And lastly, I want to show you, because, you know, 
I, I was browsing the internet one day and I came across this and I thought it was too cool to not include in this presentation. But if you overlay the Grand Parkway on some of our most prominent metro areas in the country, you will find that this thing eats up entire metro areas by itself. So if you overlay, for instance, the Baltimore-Washington metropolis uh, with the Grand Parkway, you get basically what you see on the map right here. Um, that just, it goes to show the amount of real estate that this highway covers and encircles. It's quite interesting. And when people talk about an outer beltway for D.C. there, it almost makes more sense to do an outer beltway of both cities because of how crowded that area is. So just, just to mention on the left here, is there any plans in the future to possibly close that little uh, link there where they don't connect? Uh, you mean like between... Like along 146 there. Like, so I think that Section A... Well, I'll, I'll expl Well, let's go... We can count that as a fourth unbuilt section, I suppose. Um, so we'll take these one at a time. I think that if... If there was ever to be any new construction along 146, it would be to close the gap in freeway standard. There are parts of 146 that are currently divided highway that are not freeway standard at this point. Um, you may see upgrades made there. I don't expect any of that to become a toll road at any point in the future. Um, but there is movement on the Texas state level to eliminate the grade crossings and intersections on that section of 146. Um, Section A, from 146 westward to I-45, this would likely utilize the existing NASA 1 bypass, as well as a new freeway on a new alignment. Uh, Texas DOT has openly stated over the, in recent years that this project is currently not considered to be a viable project, and that is due to the amount of real estate that would have to be condemned and businesses and homes that would have to be destroyed in order to make way for the highway. Uh, it's not a price that Texas DOT is willing to pay at this point in time. For, so for the time being, Section A is a dead project. Section B, on the other hand, that's the one that's most likely to see construction as early as the end of the decade. Um, it is possible that the only thing in Section B that would take place would be the Alvin Bypass. That appears to be the only section that is on the fast track at this point. Um, there is no significant movement on the remainder of the Grand Parkway main line in the Alvin area. So that would be Section B. Section C, planning for Section C between 288 and US-59-I-69 was undertaken in the 2010s, um, but funding was not secured for its construction. So there is no timeline for construction of Section C at this point. So basically what we have here, the newest sections that were completed were sections H and I-1 in the Northeast. Those were made operational in 2022. Um, upgrades and the expansion of the Super 2 and section I-2B were completed in that year as well. So everything east of I-69 is more or less new in the last couple of years. Uh, with the completion of that at this point, you basically have seen all the new construction of the Grand Parkway that you can expect within the next decade. Um, I would, you know, again, you might see the Alvin Bypass come to life in the next decade, but that is not actually going to be part of a toll facility. That'll be a free, uh, non-tolled section of the Grand Parkway, from what I understand. So working our way around so the first section of the grand parkway to be constructed was in the west of the metro uh leading northward from i-69 to connect with i-10 out in fort bend county that section was completed in 1994. all the other lettered sections that i showed you on the previous slide were completed in the 2000s um, most notably the sections that i mentioned that were completed in 2022 uh, sections in the northwest of the metro were completed in 2013 and 2016. Uh, construction out in the vicinity of the Fred Hartman Bridge was initially completed in 2008 as a Super 2, but was expanded in 2022. And when you drive this highway, I mean, it's, it's already 
even in its unfinished state, it's almost 100 miles long or something like that. So it's already a, a very lengthy drive. Um, you know, this is this is Texas-style beltway construction, right? You know, you, you hear the saying, everything's bigger in Texas. Well, they're not kidding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I should mention that the section between... So sections H and I-1 in the northeast of the metro between I-69 and I-10, large sections of that were initially constructed as a Super 2 uh, when they opened to traffic in 2022. Are there any other told sections of Super 2s in the country? Uh, told sections of that are built to Super 2 standard? Or even two lanes. Um, I'm sure there are. I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. Um, Other than bridges. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know there are other examples in Texas. So I don't know if that's just a Texas thing. Um, I don't. I consider Klein Avenue in Indiana to be a toll bridge, not necessarily a toll road. Um... I was while you stepped out for a minute. I was yeah. showing them this map here. Ah. Well, <laughs> I mean that. Oh gosh. Oh, okay. That's what you that's see. What we're talking. You about. see what's going on here? Yeah. You were talking about the. I mean, and I mean, such a loop there would be wonderful. Um, that actually makes a lot of sense, other yeah. than the Chesapeake Bay nonsense that's going a- on. Am there, I correct right? though that the bridge at the eastern end of ninety nine is still horribly substandard, or they the bridge that? the bridge at the east end of ninety nine? Yes. Um, you're not talking about the bridge over the ship channel, are you? I am. We're talking about the 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 other ship channel bridge before, but this one. Well, there was nothing wrong with this one. You're talking about the Cable State Bridge. No, the. I don't know what bridge you're talking about. Uh, it's um, not on the toll road anymore. No, yeah. well, this, the the bridge, the Fred Hardman Bridge, is not tolled. No, it's it's officially where the 99 designation ends. Right. Okay. Um, so that when I went there was a problem. That yeah, Fred Hartman may have opened. When did that actually open? Is the question? Because I I feel like that wasn't there the first time I did this. Oh. Okay, yeah, it was. All right. Ignore me, then. <laughs> I, I think traffic was bad when I was there, but, cause it's, but it's four lanes each way, and in Texas, you don't know if it's good or bad. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, some people in the live chat have mentioned other examples. The Chickasaw Turnpike in Oklahoma being one. Um, or county yeah. maintained turnpikes? Toll roads? Well, toll roads that were... So the question from Jeff was toll roads that are Super 2s. Oh. There, and I mentioned, there are examples in Texas. The Chisholm Trail Parkway outside of Fort Worth is an example. Um, there are... there are exa- I think... What There's is one toll the, bridge somewhere. I want to say it's in Virginia. It's like two miles of two-lane toll for the bridge. Uh, okay. North Carolina or Virginia, somewhere around there. But yeah, me being me, I wouldn't know it. Yeah, I, I know you haven't driven that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Alabama, I think, that one of their toll roads is only two lanes. Um, yeah, well... One of, the, one of their recent... Uh, lanes, that, I think, I think it was like this two lanes built on a four-lane right-of-way, from what I recall. Maybe I I think I think you're getting into semantics between oh. road and bridge in that situation. But. No, no, this was a toll road. But now this brings to mind when I was getting contributions for my Florida pages, I got contributions from Osceola Parkway, which was a surface toll road. And when, yeah, that's a weird one. But among yeah. my various contributions, <laughs> I noted that some of these in the Orlando area were two lane roads. Probably aren't anymore, but started out that way. Yeah, not anymore. Yeah. Mark mentions 538. That's already been four-laned. Right. But so, at one point, it was two. I think, yeah, when it was built originally, I think it was a Super 2. Yep. Um, yep, so here's... These are more pictures of <clears throat> different scenes along the Grand Parkway that you will encounter if you're willing to pay the toll to see them. Ooh. Oh, you want to talk about tunnels? I love tunnels. Oh. 
All right, we have one. We have a couple honorable mentions to make you aware of. Um, the Washburn Tunnel is another crossing of the Houston Ship Channel. This one is located east of the Beltway 8 toll bridge and west of the Fred Hartman Bridge. Um, it was completed in 1950. It is the only remaining underwater vehicle tunnel in the state of Texas. Mm. Originally, there were more than one. Uh, the original Baytown Tunnel across the channel was completed around the same time, 1953, uh, but was removed in the 1990s following the completion of the Fred Hartman Bridge. Uh, the Washburn Tunnel is about 3,800 feet long and has been operated by Hectra since the year 2020. Originally, Harris County operated it on a municipal level. Uh, however, the toll road agency took it over in 2020. Uh, they are not looking to institute tolling at the tunnel. They simply have inherited the operations and maintenance of this facility. So it remains free to drive to this day. Another facility that is deserving of an honorable mention that is also free to drive is the Lynchburg Ferry, which there has been a ferry in this part of the Houston Ship Channel. This is, again... The Lynchburg Ferry is east of the Washburn Tunnel, so this is further. This we're, we're this is sandwiched in between where the Washburn Tunnel is and where the Fred Hartman Bridge is. Where, you, say, if you're interested in where this is, um, this is actually located just off of the San Jacinto uh, Monument uh, in that part of the metro. Um, there has been a ferry uh, operating commercially in this area as far back as the 1820s. Uh, it was established in 1822. It was known for a number of years as Lynch's Ferry, uh, named in honor of the ferry's, I guess, first uh, pilot, Nathaniel Lynch. Um, and that explains the name of the town of Lynchburg that sprouted up uh, mm. on the north side of the Houston Ship Channel in the years that ensued. Um, Again, this facility, which is free to cross, if you'd like, um, was taken over by Hectra in the year 2020, and the same deal that saw them inherit uh, operations and maintenance of the Washburn Tunnel, just to the west. And so that's why we're talking about them here. They're not necessarily toll facilities, but they are under the Hectra domain. So. Washburn Tunnel is the largest and first toll-free vehicular tunnel in the southern United States. According to that. that According is... to Wikipedia, which you take with as much salt as I accidentally put on my walnuts last night. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why... But mistakes. you read it on the internet, so of course it's true, right? Yeah. Well, Wikipedia never lies. Uh, of course not. Alright, that's all I got. Uh, so we can take your questions on the uh, toll roads of Greater Houston... Uh, or anything else that you have uh, any other airing of grievances I know we have a long way to go before we reach Festivus in 2024 but I, I'm, all, I'm all in favor of a 11 month early airing of the grievances if that's what people want to do um, getting that in the cold now that. well while we wait for questions I want to talk for a second about what we're doing next week. Mm. Um, so, way back in 2019, um, the first ever live episode that I ever did with any of you was to mark 10,000 subscribers on this channel. And here we are, four and a half years later, and we recently passed 20,000 subscribers on the channel. I'm sure you guys all noticed that by now. Uh, thank you to all of you who are a part of it. Um, so I was thinking about, well, what, what could we do for 20,000? Because we can't just do another webinar, because we've already sort of done that for a milestone uh, event, right? So we're going to do something that is a little bit uh ambitious i guess you could say but it's also going to be a lot of fun for the people involved um we're going to do something you're going to the season finale webinar the exclusive webinar is actually going to be on the city of austin texas so we'll be staying right here for uh, some discussion of we'll be talking about more toll roads next week steve aren't you lucky <laughs> um more toll roads that you haven't driven yet i'm sure 
I've at least I, I've been to Austin and Houston at least. So yeah, yeah. So the webinar, the main event will be the webinar at the regular time, six o'clock Eastern, next Saturday, the sixteenth. It'll be a full coverage of the city of Austin. Now, that is just where this gets started. Um, <laughs> I have been wanting to do for a long time, because um, I'm a big fan of the Beatles, and the album Let It Be is my favorite Beatles album, and I have a copy of the entire recording session of the Get Back album, which mm. became known as Let It Be from January 1969. Uh, so I've been wanting to kind of do something very similar to what they did in January 1969 for this channel. So to give you a little bit of a backstory here, um, the Beatles convert, convened in the studio in January 1969 to rehearse for what was originally going to be a TV show uh, featuring new songs that they were going to record. And they allowed camera crews in, they allowed their conversations and all that other stuff to be recorded on tape. And what eventually emerged was what was eventually released in 1970 as the album Let It Be. So there's roughly 97 hours of audio from them in the studio from start from the start of recording of this album up to the finish, basically. I wanted to, to do something very similar to that for a webinar. Because you guys have seen a lot of webinars in the past you've we've done over a hundred live episodes at this point but you've never actually gotten to see what it's like behind the scenes making one so what we're going to do is on the morning of march 16th we're all going to get together at whiz headquarters and at the start of the day there will not be a powerpoint file there will be no presentation assembled. The, the PowerPoint is going to be assembled during the day live on YouTube. And it's an interesting gimmick because you guys are going to get to see the dynamics that a few that me and a few people that I'm working with here, you know, what, how we work and what ideas we come up with and, you know, stuff like that. So you're going to get to see the creative process from literally the beginning when I say create a new PowerPoint file that's how it's going to start, and then at the end it'll be a finished PowerPoint, and then we will do the actual show in the evening as if there had not been a live show before then, you know. So it's going to be, so for the people who want to watch the, the actual making of webinar, it's going to be a... It's obviously going to be live, but this, this particular webinar will be available to channel members only. Um, and I will make it available to all channel members, regardless of what membership level you are a part of. So if you are a channel member, you will automatically have access to this making of webinar. Um, if you are not, and you would like to become a member, you can certainly become a channel member and you will have access to this webinar unlocked for you. Um, there is such a thing, by the way, of people you know, creating memberships and then, you know, eliminating them after they've watched something. I know that that's something that I've certainly done in the past. So it, the, the idea, the way the channel memberships on YouTube work is that you can create, you can sign up for, to support a channel if you like, and then you can cancel at any time without penalty. Uh, that's certainly a thing that people do. And um, that is something that I would certainly recommend. If you would like to get more of a behind the scenes look at what we do quote unquote in the studio um that is certainly going to be your best bet yes sir this says that i am subscribed what is the difference between a subscription and a membership <clears throat> um so a membership is a paid thing um on the home page of my channel there is a tab i believe it says membership um you can click on that and then there's also a there's also a button on the home page of my channel that says join and that's how you can get through yeah. to memberships. I'm looking you can at join my phone app, and it has it has the word join on it. So that would be the answer. Yeah. So you can join anytime, and you can cancel anytime. You know, I I don't really take it personally when people cancel memberships. That's all a personal preference for individuals and what they want to do and what they want to spend. You know, because at that point it's you're spending your discretional income at that point. So I don't want to tell people how to spend their money. But I will say that for any of the channel membership levels that I have to offer, this live stream will be available for 
anyone who is a paid member. Okay, so please understand that it doesn't matter what level you pick, uh, you will still get access to this making of webinar, which I believe we agreed that we will start this at 10 a.m. on March 16th. And it'll run all day, and you will basically be treated to the view of my laptop screen um, as we make this happen. And you'll be able to hear the chatter in the background. And At least I one might... four-year-old. Uh, that's a likely possibility, yeah. I, I, I'm just projecting here. <laughs> but... um, and we might turn the webcam on, too, so you can say hello to us and all that stuff. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it interesting throughout the day, that's for sure. And as I said, you will get to see everything that goes into the presentation that takes place, as usually scheduled, in the evening of March 16th. Um, so, inspired by the Beatles and the Get Back, Let It Be project, we're doing a very special behind-the-scenes all-day presentation for you guys. And... I'm really excited for it. We've never tried anything like this before, and God knows it could very well be the last one if it's an absolute train wreck, but it's something that I really was curious about, and we already have a great panel locked up and lined up for you folks next week. So I'm definitely picturing us having a rooftop incident at some point. I mean, it's the, we could go on the roof. I'm on the top floor of the building, so that, it wouldn't be that hard, you know? We could give the presentation on the roof, you know? <laughs> um, I just so, hope Sweet Loretta comes up at some point. Uh, well, we, you know, you never know. With us, I'm, with Road Geeks involved, you never know, right? I just know I'm, what, I'm looking at your album right now. It says Let It Be, and I'm thinking uh, that's going to come on at some point during the day. So, so well, I well, so I, I can't, yeah, but you know that I can't play music. Otherwise, I'll get the band hammer that's, from YouTube. That's true. So that, that's even, not Even for happen. a subscription only, they'll, they'll still monitor uh, I've never tried it, but I can't no. imagine that the rules would be any different. Interesting. Yeah, so that's, mm. yep. So inspired by my favorite band, I have a very different way of doing things lined up for you folks next week. So, on the home page of the channel, you will see the button that says join, and you can become a channel member today. And you can have access to this live stream, which will begin on Saturday morning and run through the day on Saturday. And we'll, the members only part of it will end, um, you know, mid to late afternoon. And then we'll go live with the standard stream uh, as regularly scheduled in the evening. And then if you watch from beginning to end as a channel member, you get to see us put it all together, and then you get to see the finished product in the evening, which I think is a pretty cool mm -hmm. package uh, to encompass all the work that we do behind the scenes to bring these episodes to you, which, I'm, again, I'm really excited about. Very cool. Yeah. So Definitely. that is what we have for our season finale next week so i hope to see you folks in the live chat throughout the day next week all right and if anybody has additional questions about the season finale we can certainly take those um as we transition into the video portion of the program i have a few things i want to show you guys on tape uh before we say good night um absolutely. I think we got we we've got some time. Yeah, we can I mean we can talk about anything. We can talk just, about the You've already done something I've never done. You willingly got onto a toll road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> one twenty five minimum. You can get as much as you want. Yeah. So this is one of the roads that does allow uh non tag traffic on it. Yeah, so the, the Sam Houston has but, like, if you go through the toll plazas, there are lanes for tag traffic and there are dedicated lanes for non-tag traffic. Whereas here, the exit says easy tag only. So you're on, a road, you're on a toll road where you can pay to use it, going to a toll road where you have to have the tag. That's correct. Yeah, it, it is... I, I think... I think the Sam Houston is the only one that allows non-tag traffic. Okay. Well, the, well, the only one of the ones in the Hectra system. 
Because mm-hmm. Texas DOT does allow pay by mail. But is this because this was the first one, or what, what factor led to this not be for all electronic? Um, I don't know. Um, I feel like, and this this might not be the right answer, but the feeling I get is because it's the most it's the most useful of the toll roads as a <laughs> bypass of. Well, not to you. It's not useful, but uh, for, <laughs> for yeah. in, from, you make it sound like the other ones are useless. So I don't um, that's left. It, it is a bypass of greater of central Houston, and mm-hmm. so I feel like that's <laughs> that's the one that you would want to keep open to the most potential people. Mm. Whereas a lot of the other Hectra facilities are relief routes. Do, do you have any statistics on the? tag versus cash rate on this road? Do they publish that? Uh, I don't know if they publish that. I've never seen it. Okay. So I, I, I don't know the answer to that. You say bypass is downtown. I'm looking at a map trying to figure out where it is. North, south, or east, west? Huh? Eh? I'm just trying to figure out where it is on the map of Houston. Where are you, where are you looking at? Well, we're on the, where, so yeah, we, well, where the Sam Houston is. Well, that's well where it is. That's this this road. Oh, okay. You're talking. You're just talking about the belt. The belt itself. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. As a beltway, it, Sam it's, Houston Tollway. You're saying you're saying if you want to avoid Central Houston from point A to point B, because even the six ten gets quite congested. Right. You have this as an I outer. F- I feel like they made an executive decision and said, yeah. "Look, this oh, is the okay. but this is the Thank one you. that we want to make available to the most people." Thank you. That now. So, uh, Will Carpenter wants to know: Is that a water death marker? Yeah. So this is another thing that is mm-hmm. a popular thing in the Houston area because. So much of Houston sits near sea level, and because the drainage is so poor, anytime you have low-lying roadways, that's those are the places that are going to flood the most easily. And we saw this most dramatically during Hurricane Harvey in 2017, where freeways and roads in general were turned into lakes, basically. Um, those flood markers come in handy during heavy rainstorms because a lot of these low-lying areas are very quick to flood because the drainage is so poor. Um, so they put up these markers in a lot of areas, in a lot of the vulnerable flood areas, just to kind of give people a sense of the depth of water. And it's, it's I, I would think it's more of a tool for emergency responders, but, um, you know, if there are people in the general population who happen upon a flooded out roadway they can pretty easily figure out how deep the water is i i am very intrigued by why they designed that interchange with a single underground ramp leaving from the left side of the freeway right after you got on that's so Um, backwards and the whole the whole interchange there is very strange and missing certain pieces to it and I don't know what's going on there. It's, so it's they prioritized the ramps to and from the east on West Park to the Sam Houston north because that, I would imagine, that's the heaviest of the ramp movements. Well, I don't see it. I ramp. think I don't see a westbound ramp that heads north at all. That's I'm yeah. looking at. I'm looking at this. It's just strange what they've come up with. Yeah, I think the reason for the underpass is because of the power lines that okay. parallel the highway. Like, it looks to me like if you were going from West Park westbound and exiting, you would come to the frontage road traffic light and then turn right to get to the ramp to get on the toll. Um, <laughs> so it's it's yeah. not a full freeway to freeway, despite it being two freeways. And those being toll roads, you would expect they could pay for any ramp they want to construct. It's just, it's very curious to look at how, they can, at how this thing is designed. Yeah, I, th- I think the only... The only limited access movement was the one that we crossed on. Right. The, the same Houston south to West Park East. Yeah. That's, that's... But all the other movements could be made via the frontage roads. But right. that's the, the only limited access movement. Toll road to toll road. <laughs> yeah. Usually usually toll roads, they have a priority on connecting, and they'll accidentally skip over the free roads, as we uh, we in New Jersey know quite well. <laughs> yeah, right. That's for sure. Uh, so there's my favorite view in all of Houston that we just went through. I wasn't doing it. Uh, I 
as we merge on to 5969 northbound. 59. So, uh, yeah, I don't, so... I don't count the <laughs> There are still a lot of signs in Houston Metro that don't even acknowledge the interstate. Yeah. So you're two, not... I like 2, 69... Eh. That, to me, 2 is a continuous freeway. 69 is a lot of little pieces. Get it connected before you sign it. There's no reason to sign it if it's already a freeway. That's my video. Whatever. Well, did you hear the news that came out of Texas this week about future interstates? This week? No. Um, so, you know about the 69 EC and W nonsense. I've, I've clinched two of them, 69W being very easy to clinch. Yeah. 69C, not a whole lot harder. Well, apparently there's about to be, or I think it was a passed as part of a, a bill in Congress, there's going to now be a I-27 and E and W. No joke. <laughs> Can they just have a regular 27 extended? All right, so there is going to be a part of it that is regular 27 that will fork into a 27 E and W and come back together as 27 at Lubbock. And then north of Amarillo, they're saying it's going to be 27N. All right. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so from, from the... Get a letter in there somewhere. So wait, 27E and W come back together before Lubbock. I assume you mean this is south of Lubbock. So it begins in Laredo, goes up towards Midland and San Angelo, splits into E and W, comes to, back together... To, to serve Midland and Odessa separately, basically. I guess, yeah. That makes sense. And then comes back together up yep. into Lubbock... And then at Amarillo, Amarillo northward is 27N. Will 27N connect to 27, or will it will it still uh, hit downtown and then pick up on the other side? Is a freeway all over? I mean, it'll downtown? overlap with I-40 for part of it, but... Oh, that's sad. I, 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 I was hoping that the reason they do this is 27 splits into the four downtown streets. Right now, <laughs> right now yeah, right. it forms a freeway after it gets back together. So simply call that freeway 27N... And you have a two-mile gap where it's all surface streets, and that's why it's 27 and not just 27. I'm going to go with that argument over anything else. I, well, you know what? I don't know what the hell they're <laughs> thinking about. Like, the yeah. FHWA severely frowned upon lettered suffixes back in the 1970s. Yeah. Um, they only allowed the Twin Cities I-35 branches and the DFW I-35 branches to stand. Yes. Um, now all of a sudden, apparently that's not a thing anymore. <laughs> now Texas is becoming the home of the lettered suffix routes. Yep. Because in addition to the 69 and 27 examples, you may also be familiar with the I-14 proposal. There's supposed to be a 14N and 14S somewhere I did not out know in that. West Texas. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, so that hey, you know, first just, you have just... to build fourteen before you can split it. Well, apparently, apparently not necessarily. Everyone but dreams big in Texas. Yeah, well, we're gonna, we're gonna have to add digit interstate numbers. I just want everything two numbers and a and a letter. Yeah, well, you're just, you're gonna have to add more letters to the alphabet. We're gonna have to use <laughs> Greek letters at some point. Kansas City's jealous. Well, they, yeah, they, well, they yeah, can right. Only do it to exit numbers. Texas can do it to all their roads. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to run out of letters in Texas. You know, when they build the extension of I-45 north of Dallas, it's going to be I-45 Alpha and 45 Beta. <laughs> <laughs> going to be out of letters, you know. Well, if Excel can deal with their columns, Texas can deal with their highways. You know, that's, you know, the engineers, like Steve and I, like, I would love to see an I-30 yeah. Theta. You know, like, <laughs> they're just going to start calling these I forty seven, I thirty two, thirty four, thirty six, thirty eight. They can just stack them like that. Yeah, this is Texas. Why not? I, th- I, a I think thirty two yeah. A through Z. They've got all the room to build. Them. I think that you know, in Austin, they should just build a bypass of Austin where it's I thirty five Pi, and then we can just like have free Pi every time we drive it. Well, that would be the perfect designation yeah. for a Beltway. Yeah, well, because of the, I, yeah. I know where you're going with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. circumferential yeah. in nature. But yeah. Right now, yeah. I-35 in Austin, you should totally be splitting the upper and lower levels into 35U and 35L, and sign it that way. Yeah. With it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. If you're gonna do something stupid like this 27 thing, then yeah, just what's stopping you from that at that point? 
I do like these little cable stayed toll things, by the way. Yeah, isn't that yeah, neat? Yeah, they're, they're nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, they they make the they make the paying of the toll look nice. Yeah. I, I, so you have to give them credit for that. I'll be honest. I'm looking at this like I want to go under that. Wait, wait. In someone else's car. Well, it would be by definition. It would be a rental car. If it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this is the um, <clears throat> this is the Tomball Tollway, and this is. I don't know that there are signs that tell you when you have entered Montgomery County from Harris County and vice versa. I don't remember if those signs are even on this highway, but somewhere in this area we pass into another jurisdiction. From the connecting roads, you would see a change in the shield, presumably. Um, yeah, so there are, there are different shields on the frontage roads, yeah. I'd be curious to see one of those. It sounds like so there. So the Montgomery County section of the tollway has its own shield, but it's only posted on the frontage road, from what I understand. So that's why I don't have any pictures of it. Montgomery County. Yeah. So the um, Montgomery County section of two forty nine. There's like a special weird looking two forty nine shield County that's part of that. Images. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you see what I'm look, talking about, right? Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> yep. Nice. It's the shape of an auto route shield with a Texas flag in it instead. Wow, I want to get to these roads between this and the uh, the Fort Bend. I want to see these shields. Only in Texas. Uh, let's see here. Are there any interstate beltways signed in or outer? Uh, Mark Moore provided an answer with 485. Not um, in Texas, though. Well, I think he was talking just in general. In general, yes. Texas, um, I, I think, just varies the directions as you go, which is more common. But, right. Yeah, it, it, it depends where you are. Right, right. Um, I think there's still plate on the uh, DC Beltway. This is out of tollway. Um, I know that you have inner outer on the Baltimore Beltway, 695. Um, I think I think you do see inner outer at times on the Capitol Beltway. I mean, yeah, because when I think of 695, it generally is signed with directions. So you may see these shields, but it's the exception, not the rule, whereas 485, it's the rule. Yeah. I think that's the question that's being asked. Also, of course, uh, Newport News 64 is its own beltway. Wow, 64 gets really weird. If you're trying, don't, you can't follow, if you're in the Hampton Roads area, try, you can't really follow 64 if you're trying to follow cardinal directions, because it just gets really confusing. But I, I thought that, that does get signed as in or out, though, in terms of Um, I, maybe, maybe it does now, I, I don't know. Probably, or maybe it did, but it doesn't, I, I thought it had those shields for the... It really should be. Part. Like, within right. the Hampton Roads Beltway section, it absolutely should be. Um... Because, and I think in, for the most part, they just don't sign directions. They just say 64 Chesapeake or 64 Hampton. That might be what it is, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, like, you can't, you can't, like, if you want to get on 64 East and you're in Virginia Beach, like, what does that even mean? You see what <laughs> I'm saying? Trying like, to it, go, <laughs> like, you're trying to go into the ocean, right? Uh, yeah, like, it, it becomes impossible to follow it, it very quickly. Yeah. I mean, you have the New Jersey debacle where 295 West in Pennsylvania heads south while 95 South heads west. And it's because um, we didn't want to change directions. Because if the, road, if the part around Trenton is east-west, then it needs to increase, exit numbers need to start at zero at the river. We can't do that because it already starts at zero down below. <laughs> it's like, like I would have loved to tell them Beltways somehow managed to get around this problem, <laughs> but I was too late to be able to do that because they'd already made the decision. Yeah, you're right. And so, because New Jersey went north south the whole way, Pennsylvania had to go east west. That you didn't go from northbound to southbound, despite that having been the case for years with 295 North Magic would be coming 95 south. 
Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, that's that's the New Jersey rant over. <laughs> well, you're here, so every time you're on there has to be a New Jersey rant of some sort. <laughs> yeah, but 295 very well could have just been made in or out or once it got to tra- once it got to 195, just ditch the directions at that point because where are you really going to stay? On oh yeah, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. That, well, that that's how that that gets stupid in a hurry. Yeah. Um. But yeah, they they didn't want to do inner outer, so well, it is what it is. So this is the Hardy Toll Road, and you can see the railroad right of way and the median of the highway. It's a it's a fun experience if you a don't mind paying the toll, mm-hmm. and b if you like railroads infrastructure. How many lines are on that railroad? Uh, there's two, one it's a wheel. it's two. a no. what. <laughs> there's, there's one there's one line that the left wheels follow and there's one line that the right wheels follow oh, aren't, aren't you, you aren't you a genius yeah oh. um i think it's double track through here i'm saying there's lights there i think so yeah no but, but like like you're talking lines like like railway rail the mark the right the, the owners following lanes i'm talking about lanes. oh you're talking about number of rails okay yeah because when I, when I think of lines i'm thinking like number of owners that may use it because they're owned no, by no, no, one, yeah. but sometimes they're shared trackage and whatever, so I wasn't sure if that's what you are getting at. No, nah, I wasn't sure what to call them, but, uh, okay. yeah. You were just talking about number of tracks. Okay. <clears throat> yep, so... I would say that, in general, this is, like, the most memorable stretch of this tollway. Um, it's certainly the most unique in the Houston area. Um, because of the railroad component to it. Um, <clears throat> are you joining us next week? What's your deal? Yep, uh, my deal is I'm doing my annual uh, Quiz Bowl tournament reading, so I will come up here as soon as that's finished. My, I'm going to come on up basically right before we get to the uh, regular broadcast portion. I'm going to play the role of person who did not see how it all got put together, and I will just ooh and ah at the final product and be amazed that it got put together in a single day and periodically ask how you got this together and you can speak to it. So my, my, my job is to make you guys look good or something like that. <laughs> yeah, so you're going you're gonna to show up after we all did all, our, all the work during the day on this PowerPoint, and you're going to steal all the glory, right? No, I'm going to be giving you all the glory and be like, this is amazing. I can't believe you did this sort of thing. Uh, but no, I, I legitimately can't watch it during the day. So I'm, I want to come on up. I want to see everybody up here. And I'm going to, I'm just going to be, in, I'm interested in the whole thing. I'm sad that I can't make it, but I've, I've uh, got a commitment to high school students and uh, I don't want to, I don't want to go back on that. Well, you, you, you can cancel on them. It's no big deal. Uh, they, they the high school students are stupid, so you know. No, no. <laughs> Livingston High School now wins national tournaments, so I. Uh, the national th- tournaments for what? Quiz ball. I don't know what that Academic is. Academic team. Oh, dude. Is that... dude, there's all sorts of movies about it. Yeah, well, I was stupid in high school, so I didn't get to do that stuff. I can tell you that uh, one time I successfully got a Rhodes question into one of those. I was thrilled. Oh, really? It's things that are factual that. That you have to be widely interested in a range of weird things to follow all these things. There's a lot of questions about old books, and so have you read this classic novel and remember the characters in it sort of thing. Okay. Questions about science. It, it goes all over the place, and it's sort of testing how the, the kids who are good in a lot of different areas. Okay. So. Oh, very maybe. nice. So the Hardy ends at the 610, um, just a short distance east of I-45. In fact, if you were to take the ramp onto 610 west at this point, the very first interchange you would come to upon merging onto 610 would be the stack interchange for I-45. Um, but in about 10, maybe 15 years from now, the Hardy will be continuing further south from here, uh, right into downtown. <clears throat> Be interesting to 
interested to see. I, I, I looked briefly at a map. It looks like there's some rail lines that head south from there, so it's probably going where those are to minimize it, damage. It'll it'll continue to shadow the railroad corridor yeah. and the power line corridor that are already there, yeah. It, some of the work that's already been done, um, I, they've, they've built new overpasses over the right-of-way, and they've cleared out utilities in the area, so... They already have a, a right of way in the area that's well defined. It's just a matter of where it ties yeah. into the downtown freeway system. I, I, it looked to me that it would tie in fairly close to sixty nine, like very, very east a bit from. I think that's what they want to do at this yeah. point. Yeah. Because <clears throat> remember, that's where the main line of I forty five is going to go. So, at that northeast corner where all those freeways converge and split from each other, that's probably where they're going to stick the Hardy connector. <clears throat> I think I did the Washburn Tunnel. I, I certainly hope I did the Washburn this Tunnel. Is, well, here is the Washburn Tunnel. Yeah. Um, this brick line. I'm pretty sure I did this last time I was in Houston. Yeah, this is this is a classic. Yes. Uh, so if you're in the area and you're looking for something unique to drive in the state of Texas, yes. uh, I would definitely recommend this. It's like the Center 2 Little Lincoln Tunnel in a way. A little, a little sharper overall, but... Yeah, 90, 90% sure that I did drive this. It seems very familiar. It's a fun drive. They could use a second tube. Uh, there's, there's a fair amount of traffic out this yeah. way. Also, a lot safer to have two lanes go in the same direction. So, um, I'm gonna make the I'm gonna make the case to Texas. Tell them we'll tell them why they need it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I just like tunnel construction. I don't know. I you know what I'm a I'm a fan of big infrastructure projects in general. So I showed up to the um, Alaska Way one. And uh, my company was involved, and sure enough, I got to the opening just as a tourist, and I sat down and looked over, and there's a couple people from our New York office sitting there. I'm just like, okay, so y you guys probably didn't come here on vacation, did you? And we chatted for a bit, but no, they, they were principal workers on it, so it was, it was fun to show up and just randomly, <laughs> randomly recognize people in Washington. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That was a great one, though. I, I, I went there specifically because we got to uh, walk the old tunnel before they closed it off and demolished it, and walk the new tunnel. Ah. Yeah, it was, it was, or, I'm sorry, it was walk the, it, no, because the old tunnel was still in use, I'm sorry, it was just walk the whole thing. Walk the old tunnel to get to the new tunnel. Right. Then we, but then we walked, uh, we had a little mini road meet around it, we walked around the piers for the, that they had already removed from the old viaduct. Oh, man, it was good. Yeah, weirdly, you've been a part of two road meets in Seattle. Yes. Over the years. <laughs> I, I planned them, I, not just part of them. I, those were my. Yeah, and you meetings. planned them, so, yes. you know. <laughs> I, do, I no longer believe I hold the record for farthest away, even though I did have a road meet in. Uh, let's see, where did you show up? Ireland. Um, I had a road meet in Dublin not that long ago. Was that. The, I didn't know that was a thing, really. <laughs> Well, I know about the one in Alaska, and I know about the one in Iceland. But I didn't know there was one in Ireland. I reached out to Sabre to uh, see if anyone was able to meet up that day, and I a couple people were interested, but only one of them actually showed up, and we went on tour for a couple hours. Well, you only need two people for a road meet. It was announced. It was scheduled, so that's that. All right, it's, it's canon. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. people that, that I only had one guy show up. I don't. I didn't enter it in our official road meet uh, listing, but it it was organized as such. Yeah. So that's another thing. Like you mentioned the you mentioned that, and I want to touch on that too. That once my obligations for this season of programs ends next week, I am going to be getting back into the history of road meets project that. Uh, I, I've collected about 230 different meat photos from the last 25 mm -hmm. years. 
And I think I've pretty much exhausted everything that I can at this point. There's always the possibility that there might be an odd meat or two that will pop up at some point in the future. Um, but yeah, 230 meat photos. I mean, I gotta look at pictures of you guys while Ooh. I'm doing my research. Like, Jesus. I have been to less than 100 bird meets, I think. So you're, you're looking at pictures of other people, mostly. I know, that's, that's the scary part. Yeah, but like you're bad enough. <laughs> I, I've been to what, four or five, so I'm pretty sure uh, you won't see me too. Yeah, you're not so bad. I take a photo <laughs> at every meet I attend, even if they're not all up. But, Is there a picture of the Dublin? I don't because there were only two of us, so there may not have been a meet photo. Yeah. There may have been, though. I'd have to get to my photo stash to figure that out. Would right this... now, I just want to look at this. Oh, that's fair. But would this be on your website or no? I have bad. Not this. Not I am starting to get little pieces of things back up. I'm trying to get momentum going. Um, right now I've got other personal stuff going on, but I'm hoping that by mid-year when the other stuff starts tailing off that I can uh, start diving back in more to my website. I'm going to keep doing what I can till then. But Okay. Real quick, so is this all that was rebuilt here to the right? The approach. Approaches this is... were built just fine. It's the cable stayed main span that... That's that the, the part that was yeah. Okay. So you got the approach up yeah. to here, the last support, and that's it. <laughs> you get some, like, evil Knievel action there. <laughs> yeah, the approaches were fine. They were not affected by the design rebuild. Because yeah. um, those are standard engineering versus cable state is done custom every time for the cable layout. Yeah, and so those approaches have actually been there for a few years now. Just, like, dead-ending in midair like that. <clears throat> yep, there's. But you can see why this bridge would be an issue, because you'd have no shoulders, and it was a four-lane bridge that was not built with expansion in mind. So it was. It's. It's always in modern times. This century, it's been a choke point routinely. Uh, the new bridge will have a total of eight lanes, yeah. four per direction. That the new one that they're building right now is just four. Move two and two over to that, then build yeah. the other four together. Yep. And in the end, you got eight on two parallel structures that are right next to each other, but I'm sure structurally independent. So if something happened to one of them, God forbid, the other one could still remain open. Um, I'm assuming they're not tying these together to the point that if something happened to one, it would bring the other one down with it. Other um, than that, top of the uh, W there. Yeah, but but that could be two structures that you put a little surface concrete to make it visually look the same, but they're not structurally joined. At the there could be like a cold joint there or something. I'm, like I'm thinking they're going to make yeah. it so that, that the, in theory, if they have to take one down and rebuild it, the other one can remain afloat. I'm, I'm yeah, cause where, yeah. I mean, cause where that, where those two join to make the W there's no structural component up in that area. Like there's no cables being yeah. housed in that area. So that's, that's more of an architectural Ooh, element shields. than it is a, uh, that it is a structural element. I like that old shield, the old Beltway 8 shield. There are a lot of old Beltway 8 shields and Beltway 8 toll bridge shields. I've only clinched still in Texas this area. not Beltway 8, so I've got to get back down there and clinch Beltway. Well, if you want to find, this is my uh, hint, hint for you. If you mm -hmm. like old Beltway 8 toll bridge shields, you know the ones I'm I've, talking about, right? Those I've seen. You've seen Those, those are all over various roads. Yeah, there's still a bunch of them along 225 on the frontage roads. I mean, when I, when I was clin went back to clinch 6 again, but whatever else I was driving, I was missing a small piece of 6 that was uh, flooded out, or yeah, I think it was flooded out the first time I went. And I, I've ended up, I ended up going by a, a buttload of those uh, bridge shields. Uh huh. Which is fun, but yeah, because those were only issued in the early '80s when the bridge opened. They, well, I guess, I guess some of them have been reissued in recent years for some reason. But the vast majority of the ones that you will find in the wild are like 40 years old. Well, you showed in the beginning of your slide presentation. You had in the upper right the modern one. And you showed us one of the worn, older ones with a different wide eight on it. Yeah. So, yeah, I was keeping an eye out for the older ones. After a couple of the newer ones, I realized they were everywhere. And I found a couple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but just an old Texas state route shield, which is one I was pointing out, the Beltway 8, 
it's hard to find worn Texas shields. They replace those a lot. Yeah. Farm, farm roads more so, but state routes, those get replaced. So it was interesting to see a few old ones at that intersection. Yeah, so I will show you the what is currently the eastern end of Texas 99, a.k.a. the Grand Parkway, and then we will sign off uh, after this. Um, so it's been good having a live studio audience in here again for the first time in a little while. It's been over, it's been well over a month because the the show I did last week was an all remote affair, and then I was out of town for a month or two weeks worth or a month's worth of episodes um, prior to that. So it's been a while since anybody's actually been here uh, taking part in an episode with me. Oh, I missed you. No, I missed you too. Thanks for having us. Uh, you're you're not so bad. You can come back. I don't know about him, but mm. <laughs> see you in twenty twenty six. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, so we will leave you with this uh, drive over the Fred Hartman Bridge, uh, which is Highway one forty six at near the and east end of the Houston Ship Channel. I call this the M Bridge. Yeah, so like the this new is, one is the new one is the W bridge, just the M bridge. Yeah, so basically the difference structurally between this bridge and the new Beltway Eight bridge is that there's going to be a W across the top, so that it looks so that the pylons turn into an X instead of a diamond shape. Which again is an architectural treatment that I I don't think has ever been attempted on any other cable stay, and certainly in this hemisphere. But, uh, yeah, I think that's all I got. I mean, if anybody's got, I think, I think we've addressed all the questions that have come up in the chat at this point. Um, so unless anybody's got anything last minute that they want to throw out there, I think, I think we're in, I think we're in good shape and we can sign off. I, I definitely want to thank um, all the contributors in the live chat this evening. Um, I want to thank Jeff and Mr. Albert for being here in person. Yeah. Um, it was very nice of them to take this two hours of their life that they will never get back and spend, spend it here, which I really appreciate. So you are, you are our life tonight. Aww. Um, and as a final reminder, before we sign off, um, in case anybody missed my spiel a few minutes ago about this, um, about the season finale presentation, we have our regularly scheduled webinar on the evening of March 16th, next Saturday at 6 o'clock Eastern, featuring the city of Austin, Texas. And during the day, we will have a members-only live stream uh, featuring and chronicling the making of said PowerPoint file that will be presented in the evening. Um, you can click on the links on the channel homepage to join and become a channel member. This uh, making of live stream will be open to all channel members, regardless of what level you are a member. Um, and I look forward to seeing you guys for both of these episodes, uh, beginning in the morning of the 16th and going right through the day to the presentation itself uh, in the evening. So that is how... That is how we are going to roll next Saturday. Really looking forward to it. Um, and that is all I've got for this week. So I'm going to sign off. I think we're going to leave it at that this week. Uh, so thank you to everybody who tuned in and joined us. Uh, you guys in the live chat have been great as always. And I look forward to seeing you guys one final time this season, our fifth winter of programming, uh, next Saturday. So until then... Happy travels and all that good stuff. Stay safe out there. And I will talk to you again next time. Bye-bye. Yeah.